All right, so in this video, I'm going to run through chapter five, question number 13 in the book. I like this question because it emphasizes the Amphison hypothesis of the thermodynamic protein folding principle. That is, the sequence of a protein determines its structure. And it also introduces you to the common torques that you'll be dealing a lot more with later in the class. So we are given a folded protein, which has six ion pairs, so that is 12 residues in total. And there's a chemical crosslinker that forms covalent bonds between these ion pairs. And that means that once you throw the chemical crosslinker in, forms bonds, you're not going to be able to pull them apart. So this protein is submitted to two different conditions. This is pulled from the Amphenson experiment, but it's, the idea is the same. The first condition, we add urea, which is a denaturant, so it unfolds. Um, and then remove urea, so it folds back up. And add the crosslinker. And when that happens, we get 100% activity. And then in the second condition, we add the urea, allow it to unfold, it's unfolded state, and then add the cross linker here, and then remove the urea. So the idea is, is the cross linker um, acts on the protein when it's in these random unfolded conformations. And so you can get all these different cross link species. And the important thing is that only one crosslink species has uh, any activity. And all the rest do not. So the question goes on to ask, what is the activity uh, after submitting it to conditions in B? So we can say that the percent activity is going to be the number of correctly folded proteins divided by the total number. And if we assume that in the unfolded condition, every single cross-linking species is equally possible, then that is just simply ratio of number of correct conformations, which as we described before is one, to the total number of possible conformations. Okay. So there are some assumptions built into this problem. The assumptions are that all cross links are equally likely and this is contingent upon the assumption which is given up here actually in the question that all unfolded conformations are equally likely and also that the cross-linking species are not too close to each other I'll give you an example of why that's important over here. So here's the here's the unfolded protein. And let's say that here's cross-linking species one, here's cross-linking species two. And here's another possible species that this red one can cross-link with. So when you have it in its totally unfolded conformation at the cross-linker, it should be that any cross-link is possible. But if you have two cross-linking species, really close to each other, there's going to be an artificially increased concentration in that area. So you're going to get more likely cross-linking between that species than you are going to, say, get a cross-link between there. And that messes up the probabilities and mixes everything about. So the assumption that cross-links are not too close to each other is also important. The last assumption is that proteins only cross-link to themselves. Similarly to the previous assumption, if you had proteins cross-linking between different proteins, it would mess up the probabilities. And you can affect this by just having the proteins dilute enough to prevent cross-linking. All right, now I'm going to show you a couple of different strategies to solve this problem. First one's going to be one that's in the book and is used to solve the Amphenson problem. And the second one's going to be one that I find a little bit more intuitive. So in the book, what they do is they establish a row for the pairs. 
And it's important to note that this is a little bit different than the Amphitsa problem because these columns actually are not interchangeable. So there are six ion pairs possible. And we're going to calculate a number of ways that we can form all of these. So for the first row, the number of ways we can choose the first species is going to be just six. And the number of ways we can form the, choose the second one is also six, which is going to be 36 ways to form the first ion pair. And then for every one of those 36 ways, there are 25. We're going to actually multiply them together just to get how many ways we can form the first and second rows. And then we can use the same principle to go down the rows and multiplying them all together. They're not additive, they're actually multiplicative. And we end up getting some large number. But this is not our final answer because we've taken these ion pairs and pretended that there is a certain order to them that matters. Whereas the order that we form these ion pairs in doesn't matter. Because in the end, they're all going to be just part of this final protein which has all of its ion pairs covalently linked. What we have to do is we have to reduce this big number over here by the number of ways that we can rearrange these ion pairs, which is going to be 6 factorial. So if you divide that by 6 factorial, the number of possible crosslinks you get is 720. And now let me show you a second way to solve this problem. We just draw out all of the pairs that can occur. And we're going to just go one by one through them to see how many different possible ones there are. So for the first one of the species, there are six possible pairs that can form. And for every one of those six, there are now five possible ones for the second species and then for every 30 first and second combinations there are four for the third and then for every one of those we have three and then on and on two and one and that is going to be six factorial which is the same as the number above, 720. And then to get the percent activity from that, we divide the total number of active confirmations, which is one, divided by the total number of possible confirmations, which is 720, which gives us an activity of 0.014%.